All right, guys. Um, good to see you again. Good afternoon. Today I'm going to tell you about uh, an algorithm that's used in uh, system identification. It's called expectation maximization. And um, we are still thinking about structural learning where we have a set of equations that describes the state update and we have a set of equations that describe the measurement. And what we want to know are the parameters in these equations. The A, the B, the C, and the noises. And in the particular task that I want to show you today, um, the approach differs very much from the, the work that I showed you on, uh, on subspace analysis, in that subspace analysis is what's used by control theorists. Expectation maximization is a learning rule that's used, it's an iterative procedure that's used for people in machine learning. And, you know, they're just different fields, they've used different tools. The fundamental power of the, um, um, of the state space, uh, so the, the subspace approach is that it gives you an estimate of the number of hidden states, the size of the vector x. In the process that I'm going to show you today, you have to assume that. You have to make a guess about that number. And then based on that, you're going to come up with the best estimate that you have of the, the parameters of system A, B, and C. Um, and this uh, expectation optimization, as applied to uh, um, the uh, state space equation, finding those parameters, something that uh, um, was uh, described about the same time as the subspace analysis, and it was in the late 90s when the paper was written. So um, that's what we're going to be talking about today. And to, to start things off, I want to, so this is now uh, the, the last parts of the chapter 9. Um, and what, what I want to start with is um, how to apply the algorithms that we've been learning, the subspace analysis, and for example, today's, to, you know, you've collected some data from some individual, some system that learns, and you want to identify that learner. And um, we did this a few years ago in a task where people were asked to make uh, eye movement. So they had a stimulus, they were given a target here, they made a saccade to that target, and then what happened is that we jumped the target, so that we made it so that at, after the end of their saccade, the target that used to be here, now it appeared here. So at the end of the movement, it appeared that there was this error, this error here. And this error caused adaptation. So for example, if you look at the experiment, so here's, here's the way the experiment went. Um, the position of the target T was on the y-axis, trial is on the x-axis, so x is trial, y is the change in the position of the target, delta T here. And so it began with a delta T that was negative, and then, you know, it went positive, and then to zero. And what people did is that they adapted so that they began to reduce this error, so they began to learn. Then there was a set break, they forgot a little bit, they learned set break, they forgot a little bit, they learned something like this. Then the perturbation was reversed as follows. And then what happened was that um, we took data like this and we said, all right, what are the states that describe this learner and what was the parameters associated with that learning system? So let me write down the equations for such a thing. So suppose that we can imagine the learner as um, having um, a state x and um, um, what we're interested in is describing how it changes the state. So there's some state x, with the, maybe we don't know its size, and this represents a memory state in the learner, and um, that changes from trial to trial as follows. What, what's going to happen is that this, this system is going to, and in this case we're going to assume it's a vector b rather than a matrix that it's going to be learning from, it's going to learn from errors. I'm going to call this y tilde, that's the error in trial n plus epsilon x. So the state update equation looks like this. It's going to have some memory state x, as many dimensions as you like. It's going to learn from error y tilde. And that's going to be this b that tells us how, how much it's going to learn from error. And then um, the action that the, that the learner produces, the thing that I can measure is y. That's his action maybe <coughs> saccade length. The saccade that he makes depends on where the target is, t in trial n, and maybe he's, he's got some bias in him so that whenever I show him a target at 10 degrees, he always makes a saccade to 9 degrees. 
So I'm going to have this bias here. Um, I'm going to call it YB, some constant bias in his, in his actions. And then uh, his, his performance also depends on these state x, these memory states. So I'm going to have C transpose x of n plus epsilon y. So this is my, um, my, uh, uh, my uh, system of equations that I want to fit to the behavior of the subject. So there's some state that this individual has, and that state changes as a function of error and tends to decay to zero without error. And he performs an action y that I can measure. That action depends on where the target was, some inherent bias that he has, and this, his states that tell him how those states are related to the, um, the particular action he's making. So I don't know C, I don't know A, I don't know B, and I don't know the noises. What I do know is y the action that the, that, the, that the subject produced on trial n, and where I put the target on that trial, t. So I can estimate this tilde here, y tilde, the error, as being the difference between the action that he did and um, the, uh, the consequences of it. So I can say y tilde of n um, is equal to where I put the target, t of n, plus say I put a perturbation to that target. And I'm going to call that u of n. This is the perturbation that I did. This is what I plotted here, is u of n here. u of n is the perturbation that I plot. I call it delta t, which is basically the change in the target that I made. This is, this is the perturbation that I produced. So this is, this is the, where the target was. This is where the target ended up. The difference between that and what the subject actually did, which is the action that he performed, um, it's, uh, 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 um, it's going to be YB, what, what, uh, what, um, uh, the, well, it's going to be Y of N minus Y of B. Y of N plus YB. So this is what he expected to happen. This is what actually did happen. The target was moved by some amount, and here's what he expected to happen to it. That's equal to... Um, let's see, t cancels here, it's going to become u of n, this cancels here, um, minus c transpose x of n minus epsilon y. So this is the state update equation, this is the measurement equation, and this is what goes into here. Y tilde is the difference between um, u, what I did, and what the subject expected. So now I'm going to put this back into this equation now. So I have x of n plus 1 is equal to a x of n plus b times y tilde, which is u of n minus c transpose x of n epsilon y plus epsilon x, which is equal to a minus b c transpose x of n plus b u of n minus b epsilon y plus epsilon x. So that's my, that's my state update equation. It's written in the canonical form. So I have this matrix that I'm going to be estimating, this vector that I'm going to be estimating, and these noises here. Good pen. Yeah. So when people pr pr perform actions, they may have a bias. So it may not be that they, when you give them a, a target, they may not move to the target. They may consistently undershoot it. OK, so that has nothing to do with the experiment setup. It's just kind of a yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the, idea that, the idea that you have, I give you something to do, you do it. and. What, for whatever reason, you don't go where I ask you to do. You go do something other than that. But you do it consistently. You have a bias in your behavior. So we want to take that into account when we want to find the difference between what you predicted and what you observed. So if you had known that you had a bias, by the time you get to the end of your movement, this error here is not really an error. It's just you predicted it. So that's why I'm taking, taking that into account. Okay. This Does one. it show up later? No, it, it means, so it's, it's in, in fitting these things, ah, I'm sorry, it's so difficult to see the darn thing. Um, 
in fitting these things to behavior, what, what one of the important things is that what is error, right? And what error is, is the difference between is the difference between what I observed minus what I predicted. So what is the hat? What did I predict? Well, I, I don't really know what you predicted. All I can see is that what I would imagine is that your prediction should be based on all the previous data is that, you know, on, on average you have this bias in your performance. So that must be what you would predict on that trial. So I'm guessing that would be the case, which is why I put this bias here in, in here. In principle, we have to guess what is error that you're learning from. Um, and in this case, there's, if there's bias in your performance, I assume that doesn't go into your errors. Okay. So, okay, so what this means is that when one fits data like this, what one gets is, so let me just fill this in. So here's, here's the data, here's the performance. You know, what one gets is that there is some, um, th it, it, it ends up with two states here, just like the, what David showed you guys in the, in the two-state model. What one gets is that there's a, there's a fast state that rapidly learns, forgets. Rapidly learns, forgets. And then there's a slow state that slowly builds. And one can fit this kind of state-space model to actual data, and you get this two-state process out of it. Now, the lecture today is about um, the problem of fitting such system of equations to data using a different concept, a concept of expectation maximization, EM. And our problem remains the same. The particular problem that I want to solve for you is x plus 1 equal to a x of n plus b u of n plus epsilon x, where this has variance q, and y of n is equal to c x of n plus epsilon y. This has variance y, r. Um, and what in here, our problem is as follows. What we want to do is to estimate the parameters of the system. Let me call that theta. And the parameters of the system are A, B, C. We have the noises R, Q, and we have the initial state X hat and the initial covariance P0, our uncertainty about that state. This is, um, um, these are the things that we want to estimate. And, um, on the other hand, what we also don't know are the states, x hat from trial 1 to trial n. So we don't know the states, and we don't know the parameters. In EM, what one does is that what one says is that fix the parameters in the expectation step. We fix theta, we find x hat going from 1 to n. And of course the way we do that is via the Kalman filter. If we knew the parameters, we could find the states. In the m step, what we do is that we fix the states, we find theta. Okay, so to do the E step, you guys know how to do that. The M step is what's interesting, which is if we knew the states, how would we find the best estimate associated with the parameters? And um, it's an iterative process. If you go back and forth, and you do this until you find that it converges. So the critical thing in our formulation is going to be describing what's called the complete log likelihood. 
And what the complete log likelihood, what that means is that you want to find the probability of all the states and all the observations given that you had the inputs and the parameters theta. So it's a likelihood function, right? Unusual likelihood function only has the things that we can do. The complete log likelihood, it has also the hidden states. So what I'm going to do is to write for you what the complete log likelihood is. And so just like every other time when we do a likelihood, we find the conditions that maximizes that likelihood. So we're going to write the probability of all the hidden variables x, all the hidden states, and all the observations, the joint probability, assuming that we know the parameters of the system, assuming that we know the inputs of the system u. And then once we've written the, that, that probability, that likelihood, we find the log of that, we find then the maximization of that likelihood, we find the parameter theta that maximizes that likelihood. That's what we're going to do today. So the key step is this. This we know how to do. This is the E step. The M step is find the parameter theta that maximizes this quantity. Okay. So let's begin. So suppose that I only have the following li uh, likelihood. So I have the probability of x0, x1, y1 given u1. Suppose that's the only, we only have one observation y1. And we only have one trial. Just one. So what is this probability? So this is equal to um, p of y1 given, so this joint probability, I'm going to write it as a conditional probability. So probability, just to remind us, the joint probability, so p of a and b is p of a given b times probability of b p of a given p of a and b given c is equal to p of a given c times probability of c probability of uh, um, that b occurring given um, given c. Probability of y1, I'm going to do it here, and I'm going to write it in terms of u1 and a. So, probability of y1 given u1 and x0 and x1 times the probability of uh, x0 and x1 given u1. So um, this probability here is equal to probability of y1 given um, just x1, right? Because y1 only depends on x1. Y1 only depends on x1. It doesn't depend on u. And this probability here, p of x0 and x1, I can write it as p of x1 given u1 and x0 times probability of x0 given u1, which is equal to, this doesn't have any such, there is no dependence between x0 and u1, so then I get probability of y1 given x1 times probability of x1 given u1. and, sorry, x0. 
Okay, so that's that's my first. Uh, sorry, let me. This is the, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna go from u of zero. So for me to write this, I need to have u zero here because u zero is going to make a change from x0 to x1. So I apologize for that. This is u0. All right, so next step is I want to write what is the probability of um, x0, x1, x2, y1, y2 given u0 and u1. So I'm just going to add to this now if I have two measurements rather than one measurement. Yeah. Um, and then a. Uh huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a vector. Okay. Yep. Good question. Right. So we have two measurements now: y one and y two, rather than just one. Okay. So that's all. So before, I only had one measurement, just y1. Now I have two measurements. I want to write, where am I going? Because I want to write this probability. All the x's from 1 to n, all the y's from 1 to n, I guess, and, and all the, and the Is this still confusing? You, you see it? Okay. Well, see, x0 is a part of theta, right? x0. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to have to, you know, if, if, if I fix this, I have to find what x0 is. It's part of the, one of the things I don't know. All right. So this guy, let me, I think I'm going to write it over here. It's going to be kind of long. Well, maybe it'll fit here. Yeah, I'll All right, so P of x0, x1, x2, y1, y2 given u0 and u1. This is equal to P of y1, y2, given u going from 0 to 1, x going from 0 to 2, times P of x going from 0 to 2, given u going from 0 to 1. is equal to, I'm going to break this up, so this is P of y1, let's start with y2 I guess, y2 given u01, x02, y1 times P of y1, um, given u0 to 1, x0 to 2, second term, p of x from 0 to 2, um, let's start with p of x2 given u0 to 1, 
x1 to 2 times p of x1 to 2 u of 0 to 1. Um, okay, so this term here, this is just equal to p of y2 given x2, right? Because y2 only depends on x2. This term here, p of y1, given this, is just equal to, this is the only thing that matters is p of y1 given x2, uh, sorry, x1. Um, this term here, p of x2, what matters here is x1 and u1. Then I have this term here, which I have to break down. p of x2 given u10 and then x1 X times uh, p of x1 u01. Um, this term and then this stays as it is. This becomes the uh, p of x1. Uh, this is just zero. X1 doesn't depend on. Um, oh wait. Uh, This is why, yeah. So this is this is not right. So if I take x two out of here, what I left behind is zero and one. Then I get um, so. I have this, I have this, x2 depends on x1 and u1, then this term here, 0 and 1, Now we're in good shape. All right, so this this and this term here is just p of x zero because it doesn't depend on um, u. Oh, actually, this is just zero. Uh, That's fine. OK, so I can write the, my, um, as follows. This is equal to, just like that derivation that I have there, is a multiplication of i 
going from our, our little n, let's call it, going from 1 to n of the first probability. So what is this probability here? p of y given x. This is going to be p of y of n given x of n times n going from 1 to n of p of x of n plus 1, um, x of n. How did I write it? X of, I wrote it as x of n plus 1. Given u of n, x of n times um, p of x 0. Um, yep, it is. We're going we're to try to find it. Why? No, because... No, so, um, so in this step, we have to find theta, right? And theta includes x0. So, so x0 is going to be a normal with an expected value x hat with variance p. Yeah, sorry, I forgot it. Thank you. Okay, so we can write these things, right? Because we know the relationship. So we, we can write P of Y of N given X of N, what, what that is. So let's, let's write it. So p of y of n given x of n. That's a normal with mean um, c times x hat of n and variance uh, r, which is equal to um, 1 over square root of 2 pi raised to the power m m is the length of the vector y times this variance covariance, it's, it's determinant um, in the denominator, times an exponential of minus one half um, y minus c x hat of n transpose r minus one y minus c x hat of n. or to just CX, I guess. This is right, so that's, that's the probability of Y given X. Okay, now we have, the, the next term that we need to know is probability of x of n plus 1 given u of n and x of n. That's a um, normal with mean um, uh, a x of n plus b u of n and variance q. Does that make sense? Right. That's what this equation is. All right. So what we need to do is find the log of this quantity. Right here. I just wrote down for you what this is. I wrote down what this is. And 
this is just some some uh, mean and variance x and with some you know it has some mean and, and variance that's going to be p at time zero at the step zero. So we're going to find the log of this function. Let's write that down. So the log of of this thing that I've put there, the the log of that likelihood function, is going to be the sum of n is equal to 1 to n, that's going to be the uh, multiplication there, of this, the log of this, of this quantity here. And uh, let's write that down. Let's uh, see what that would be. Um, let me begin with what's inside the exponential. So I'm going to have a minus 1 half y minus c x of n transpose r minus 1 y minus c x of n. And uh, I'm going to have this term here. So the term that I care about is uh, a determinant that has an R in it, because R is one of the things that I need to find of the parameters that I don't know. So um, what that's going to be is um, um, minus 1 half n times log of R y times that, because remember, R is the determinant here being raised to the power of minus 1 half. So we get the of them because there's n of these things that are being multiplied by each other. So there's minus 1 half times n times the determinant of r. Um, next, what I have is the, and then I have some constants, you know, associated with 2 pi raised to the m. Let's forget about that because we don't need that. Next thing that I have is um, uh, the multiplication of uh, this times this sum here of uh, the n that are being multiplied, that normal. So I'm going to have um, uh, another exponent, minus 1 half of um, x of n plus 1 minus a x of n minus b u of n transpose times um, q minus 1 times x of n plus 1 minus a x of n minus b u of n, right? That's, that's the exponent of this normal distribution. Yes, they are. Sorry. Correct. Thank you very much. Very good. So I think that's right. So now what I need to do is um, maximize this log likelihood. So to do that, what I need to know is that what am I maximizing it with respect of? Well, we want to find the derivative of this with respect to all the things that we don't know. All those things that we don't know. A, B, C, R, Q, X hat, and P. Uh, I also have my... Um, I forgot there's also the normal is associated with uh, um, so there's um, also minus one half um, probability 
Olivia X0, which is, um, um, I guess that would be my, so the probability of X0 is a normal with mean, let's call it um, uh, mu, I guess. So this is x0 minus mu. Um, I guess I've been calling it x hat of 0, haven't I? So let me call this x hat of 0. That's our log of the complete likelihood. So what we're going to do is that for each of the parameters we're interested in, we're going to find the derivative of this with respect to that parameter. Now, the idea is that you have started with some estimate of a, b, c, r, q, x hat, and p. You begin with some estimate. Now what you do is do you maximize this log likelihood to find, you know, a better estimate. So we know this because we began with some estimate for, for theta. We found the best estimate for x hat. Now what we're going to do is that, OK, given that we have this estimate of x hat and some prior belief about what these things are, find a better estimate for them. And, and we can do that. So we're going to maximize this, uh, this, uh, this likelihood. So to do that, you notice that there are, um, these are all the same variables, right? So this is every term here, every multiplication here is going to become a scalar. Because it's just a probability, just a number. So we're going to be finding derivative of scalar quantities with respect to these matrices. So we're going to have to find the derivative of x of n transpose c transpose r minus 1 y with respect to r or with respect to c. These are matrices. That's okay. We can find derivatives of, you know, um, uh, of, of, of scalar variables with respect to matrices. It's just going to become a matrix. So derivative of the scalar variables with respect to a matrix is going to give us another matrix. And there's some useful identity um, in your uh, on the website, there's a file called use, Useful Math, and we we'll to it. And among the things that are there are how to find derivatives of scalar quantities. And for example, the derivative of the quantity A transpose XB, where A and B are vectors, dx is is the quantity A B transpose and the derivative of, uh, let's see, the other one that we're going to need here is uh, derivative of um, A transpose X transpose C X B DX x is here is a quadratic term. The reason why we're going to need that is that some of these multiplications here is going to give us a quadratic term. So for example, this multiplication here, a quadratic in a. So we're going to have to know how to find the derivative of a scalar quantity in which the matrix is being multiplied by itself. This is equal to um, of two terms. Um, it's C transpose X times A times B transpose plus C X B e A transpose. Okay. 
So let's, uh, let's do some of these derivatives. So to do that, what I'm going to do is multiply out one of them. So let's the estimate of C, matrix C here. So we have x hat. We don't know C. How do we term in terms of the quantities that have C in it? So the log of that likelihood multiply out that have C. So that's going to be a sum. Uh, let's see. I'm going to have y of n transpose r minus 1 uh, times cx of n. And I'm going to have minus xn transpose c transpose r minus 1 um, y of n. scalar quantity, which means that these two terms are the same terms, because this is the same as this, this is the transpose of that term. Um, so that's equal to minus one half, two times, um, two times y of n transpose r minus one c x of n um, plus x of n transpose c transpose r minus one c of x of n plus so forth. OK. So I can find the derivative of these. And I don't have any more c's, right? Those are the, that's the only place where c, c appears. So I want to find the derivative of this with respect to the matrix c. So this is what I'm going to use, this term here. So I have this quantity where this is A transpose and this is B, what I'm going to end up with is this transpose. So I'm going to get minus 1 half, the 2 cancels out. I'm going to get minus R minus 1 Y of N X of N transpose for the first term. This looks good. I look at this and this says, yeah, this is a this looks like a matrix of the its shape. And then for the second term, this, this is a quadratic in C. I'm gonna to need to use this. Uh, so I'm gonna get X is what I'm finding the uh, the the derivative with in this case. So that's just, just don't don't confuse that with this. So I've, I've used x and c here. I've used x and c here, but they mean different things. So in this case, um, this is a transpose, um, and um, r is here. C. This is b. So I'm going to get r minus 1, c, x of n, x of n transpose. I'm going to get two of these. Check my notes, see if I got that right. I actually did it right. So we set that equal to 0. And what we find is that, um, uh, sorry, th this, this 2 goes away too. 
because I have minus one half in the front of it. So this is just the, uh, this is just this. So I have um, r minus one c x of n x of n transpose is equal to r minus one y of n x of n transpose. So c is equal to, um, sorry, I forgot, all, the, all of this has a sum in front of it. I forgot the sum. So C, I'm going to put a hat on top of it. That's my estimate of what C is. It's going to be equal to the sum um, Y of N, X of N transpose times um, this term here, the sum inverse. So what we're going to do, we're going to replace these values here with our expected values for this. So um, I have x as a mean. And so if I, if I put the expected value for these guys, what I have is that i is equal to the sum 1 to n y of n x hat of n transpose. This I can compute, right? And this is multiplied by um, the expected value of x of n, x, x of n transpose minus 1. Expected value, expected value of x, x transpose, what is that? How can I compute that the quantity? In principle, what's the expected value of xx transpose? Well, do you remember the equation for variance? Right, so what's the equation for variance? Variance of x. Expected value of x minus its expected value, right? Times x minus its expected value. So, so this is um, the variance equation, P, variance of x. Um, the expected value of um, x. Sorry, plus. That's it. Gotta catch those stupid mistakes. Otherwise, we'd be going in circles. Okay, so this we have, right? This quantity, the variance of x, the value is right, p. And this we have as well. So this quantity here is the sum of p of n the uncertainty of the state in trial n plus the expected value x hat of n, x hat of n transpose. That's my estimate of C. If I know x hat, which is what we're assuming. So we begin 
with some estimate of a, b, and all those things. We use the common filter to estimate x hats and the uncertainties. Now we go back and re-estimate all the parameters a, b, c, and d using our state estimates, x hat. I can compute. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. What's the expected value of C? So C is, C is, so the C that will maximize the log likelihood is this, right? The hat is the expected value of C. The expected value of C is going to be the expected value of things inside here. My estimate of C is going to be the expected value of it that maximizes the log likelihood. So, so this is the C that maximizes the log likelihood, right? But, but I don't have X, right? X is a random variable. All I can do is say, okay, well, what's the expected value of C? That depends on the expected value of X and its variance. Yeah. It really is a trick that just says, well, we're going to replace these x's, which are random variables, with their expected value. And this quantity here is like a variance. Okay. All right. So let me do one more of this. It's going to be basically exactly the same, except that we're going to do it for, let's see, which, another one. I think the second one I was going to do it for was A. Why is this? Why does this make sense? So look, look at this equation. Look, look, at this, look what happened here. So y of x. Equation by x n transpose, and then solve for c. That's what that is. So, so it. it you should, when you look at it, you say, okay, well, where does this come from? It comes from multiplying both sides of the equation by xn transpose. Effectively what this is. And so there is a relationship between that and this. Um, let me do it for A. One more parameter here. So in your book, you have it for all the parameters. But um, I mean, there's no magic here, obviously. It's just finding the right know is these two rules. Find those derivatives. And because the derivatives are from the scalar quantities, they're not that tough. result here. So this is similar to um, how we're going to do the A. Basically we're going to end up when we, you know, what we're going to do is that we're going to multiply out the, equation, the second equation. This, this part here 
I want to multiply that out. We're going to get some scalar quantities that have matrix A in it. Some of them are going to look like this. Some of them are going to be the quadratic form like this. We're going to find the result of it, just like I've done here. But the, the result is going to be Uh, X sub n transpose. So we're going to see that, let me just multiply it out. Here. Even though this is not the way What I have. Uh, and then I use the expected this guy goes away. Uh, this expected value. And then finally, this expected value. value of x of n plus 1, x of n transpose, multiplied by the sum of the expected value of x of n, x of n transpose. And you notice that this estimate start out with some estimate of A, B, and all those things. You compute x hats. But you compute x hats, you get these expected values. And then now that you have your x hats, you compute your old values of x and b iterative process. And you have the similar equations for, you know, that you, you can compute the derivative of this with respect to B, the derivative of this with respect to, with respect to R, and uh, uh, initial P and X hat. Okay? So in machine learning, EM, very powerful tool, and it's this iterative process by which you assume, in the case of this structural learning problem, that you, you begin with some estimate of the E step. So you fix theta hat, use the Kalman filter to find x hat. In the N step, you fix x hat, and you find a new estimate for theta. Yes? And, uh, so when you're, uh, mm. Some parameter. Yes. Um, yeah, so let me think. What we're going to end up with is a new estimate of um, x hat.
Hmm. You know, I don't, I don't know the opposite. So when you maximize this, when you find the derivative with respect to x hat, we're going to get an x0 in there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but um, what I don't know is um, I guess that's what's the what's our we don't have an x zero here as our uh, as our given um, because I have. I'm going to confuse myself. I don't know. Let me think about it. I don't know. Good question. The good, I need to make a homework assignment for this so that everything's clarified. Learn, right? By actually doing it. All right, guys. Good luck with, this, with the sub-model. And you guys are on... Um,